Hi, I'm Fran Mayer, and welcome to another Napa Institute webcast. Our guest today is Sorab Amari. Sorab is a writer and editor whose byline has appeared in too many places and too many publications to list. Raised in a liberal Muslim family in revolutionary Iran, he emigrated to the West as a teenager and entered the Catholic Church as an adult. The story of his conversion, recounted in his book, From Fire by Water, and published by Ignatius Press, is a classic of the genre. A graduate of the University of Washington and Northeastern University School of Law, Sorab has served on the staff of the Wall Street Journal, the Wall Street Journal Europe, Commentary Magazine, and he now edits the opinion pages of the New York Post News Daily. His latest book, The Unbroken Thread, Discovering the Wisdom of Tradition in an Age of Chaos, and published by Convergent Press, is the subject of our conversation today. Each of the book's 12 core chapters is structured around a simple question, ranging from how do you justify your life, to does God need politics, to what is freedom for? And it's a terrific read and I highly recommend it. So, so Rob, thanks so much for being with us today. And thank you and to the Napa Institute for having me. It's good to catch up with an old friend, even if it's um, over video. Yeah, virtuality. Uh, so, Rob, let's start with a really simple, obvious question. I mean, why this book and why right now? Uh, why this book is um, basically it has a very short answer. And um, that answer is encapsulated by my son's name, Maximilian. He's now four years old. He was two when I began to write the book. And um, you know, as a young father, I'm frankly alarmed by the kind of society that will shape him. And that's American society today. And trying to imagine what it might look like, uh, you know, as he grows up to be a, a, a teenager and then an adult or a young adult. So it's a, it's an the book is a kind of expression of uh, of fatherly love, um, of my desire to transmit something to him, uh, uh, and that something being a way of looking at the world that uh, clashes with our reigning, um, let's say, secular liberal technocratic ideology. Um, to give him, to anchor him in something more stable. And that is, uh, I guess, tradition uh, in, a, in a broad sense, uh, not just Catholic tradition, which is a source of authority in the Catholic church with a capital T, but other traditions as well. But because um, our age is so confident about its certainties, I felt that it would be better rather than me just saying, you should believe these things, I'm going to hammer them into you, son to uh, form, form the book around questions, questions that I think that any serious person, not just scholars or academics, I'm certainly not one of those, should grapple with. And um, uh, uh, that our, again, that our kind of contemporary ideology doesn't have good answers to, or it just says that those questions aren't even worth asking anymore. So that's just been set aside. But I think those questions are very important indeed. So um, that's, that's the genesis of the book in, in brief. You know, the letter that you write to your son at the end of the book is really quite beautiful, and it kind of encapsulates the, the entire argument and the reason for the argument that you wrote the book. But why Colby, Sora? Why Maximilian Colby and not someone else? And you make a particular point in your introduction about how Colby uh, embodies a certain kind of Christian freedom. What is that freedom? Sure. So um, I begin the book with an introduction in which I I say that this is a book that says that you will find freedom not in um, the contemporary account of freedom, the, the one that's reigned in the, in the West, especially in the Anglo-American sphere for three, four centuries now, uh, which says that freedom is merely being able to choose from the widest range of options, or to put it technically, to the freedom to choose from among contraries. But uh, that true freedom is actually being, is, is to be found in virtue in the life of virtue and that means limiting yourself and that's a paradoxical argument right it says you will be free if you accept limits if you bind yourself to um, greater things than yourself um, <clears throat> and so that's and then i say in order for you, for me to explain why i need to make this argument i have to tell you about two maximilians one of them is the maximilian you and i just spoke about my son the other one is his namesake saint maximilian colby um, I, you know, as you know, I'm a convert. I was received into the church uh, in 2016. And uh, 
when I was received, I, I basically I had a choice of picking a, a, a baptism and confirmation name, and it came down to, frankly, St. Augustine and uh, St. Maximilian Kolbe. Those were the two saints that I felt spoke to me um, most profoundly. I ended up going with Augustine, and so I was, I, I was left to do something with Maximilian, and so I named my son after St. Maximilian Kolbe. <laughs> Um, this is not something I've ever told anyway. It's not even in the introduction of the book, but I feel like I, we're friends, so I can tell you. And so, no, but why? Because I, when, I, when I read the story of Maximilian Kolbe, I couldn't get it out of my system in a good way. Like I just grappled with it. Um, the idea that someone would um, is in a death camp, there's a possibility of surviving, and yet uh, he hears the anguish of a father, a father like me, who has been picked by the Nazis to, to die in punishment for an escapee from his particular prison block. He hears that man say, my wife, my children, and to, he just steps forward from the line and says, I'll die instead of him. Um, I'm getting a little bit teared up even as I recount that. Um, that to me is an, an image of perfect freedom. Um, it's obviously, it's such a clear vision of the cross. It's an icon of the cross, his life itself. Um, but also, um, it, 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 um, to me, as I write in the book, Colby in that instance um, epitomizes, as you said, Christian um, freedom, and that's a, the freedom to, um, to, to, to lay down one's life for one's friends as, as the greatest thing that one could do for one's friends, in this case, an absolute stranger. So therefore, the friend becomes every human being in some sense. Um, uh, so there's a, an element of the uh, 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 Good Samaritan in there as well. Um, and that he, in a moment where he, there's, there's no choice to be made in a Nazi death camp, uh, you um, achieve freedom, you assert your moral freedom by choosing to die. Um, now, I, I, uh, I had to do something with this story and so, um, I had to pass it on somehow. Mm -hmm. And so I named my son after him, but I want him through the book to be bound back to the tradition, the vision of life that St. Maximilian Kolbe represents, and hence the thread in the title. It's, it's my attempt to sort of uh, lasso my son and tie him to something uh, better than me, <laughs> better than my own as a human being. So, Rob, in your chapter one, um, How Do You Justify Your Life? You have a really ingenious use of C.S. Lewis, but I, I was fascinated about why you chose to use um, the book from his space trilogy rather than screw tape letters or mere Christianity or something like that. I mean, it's really, you really uh, picked one of my favorite books by Lewis and it just surprised yeah. me to see it show up in your text. Well, I, because that opening chapter is, I have to, if I have to, um, start on this case for tradition, the first thing I have to do is take care of the uh, incorrect or misperceptions about science that, are, that pervade our civilization. The idea that, um, that the questions that used to be answered using uh, philosophy and metaphysics and then revelation have somehow been answered by the Big Bang Theory or quantum mechanics or so forth. Um, so I have to immediately inoculate my son, but also the reader against that worldview. And there's no greater critic, I think, in the 20th century of this kind of scientism, which is not the same as science. Science is a wonderful, noble experiment, um, a noble project, uh, but uh, there, it has been uh, harnessed for a set of philosophical claims that are not scientific at all. And that set of philosophical claims can be summed up in the idea that the only things worthy of the name truth are those things which you can um, observe with the senses, measure with scientific instruments, um, and generally express in mathematical language. And everything else is superstition or opinion uh, and is somehow invalid from the get-go. And, and Lewis really got at that. And you know, the novel, um, uh, Out of the Silent Planet, as you know, is, is an allegorical critique of, of scientism, which was very much in the atmosphere of you know, 1920s, 1930s Britain when, when he wrote it um, and has come back. You, know, you hear echoes of some of, uh, frankly, of Lewis's villain in a lot of the science popularizers today who um, are so quick to 
dismiss the claims of, of philosophy and, and religion on dubious grounds. And that, that, that uh, quality is carried on through Paralandra and then the conclusion in that hideous strength, which is a fabulous book as well. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, yes. a, it's, a, it's a wonderful trilogy. Um, I suspect that it ties into the next question, which is in the text, you quote the line, uh, facts don't care about your feelings. Mm -hmm. And um, I wonder where that's from and why, I mean, how does it fit into your argument? Sure. So um, uh, that line is, is from my friend Ben Shapiro, um, uh, a very good friend, someone who, whose work I admire. Um, but I suggest that that, um, uh, uh, that way of looking at the world, which in a way is a, is a, is a vulgarization of, of the scientific outlook, that there's one set of things called facts, you know, gross domestic product, you know, indubitable historical events we know about, blah, blah, blah. And then another set of things called feelings. And that um, over there, there's true and false, but in every, in, in, in this other misty realm of feelings, uh, uh, sentiments, premonitions is just a uh, kind of subjectivity. And therefore this other misty realm is invalid somehow. And so, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I use that critique, uh, I use that line to jump off into the, to, to, uh, to question this idea of equating truths, stick, truths strictly with facts. Yeah, you have a, uh, the, I mean, one of the most fascinating elements about the book for me, and, I, and it, it recurred to me again and again as I read it, was the, the contrast between your heavy emphasis on the importance of remembering and the importance of memory and um, the American temperament, which really is disinclined toward the past because we're a novus seclorum, a ordo seclorum, a new order of the ages. I and mean, we have an instinctive, it's built into our DNA as a culture almost. Christopher Lash and a lot of other people also observe this, that we don't like history because it's sort of a weight that we drag around behind us and it slows us down and prevents us from looking at the future. You take exactly the opposite perspective. And um, I'd like you to talk a little bit about why memory, why remembering is so important to the way that you thought about this book. Yeah, because I was, uh, for much of my adult life, to the, once I got a kind of minimum, I majored in philosophy and then became a journalist and uh, developed a kind of social, political, intellectual consciousness. I subscribed to something like uh, uh, presentism. Mm -hmm. um, Lewis called it uh, chronological snobbery, right? The idea that whatever is, whatever is newest is best and truest as well. Um, and if something has been, so, you know, I, I took philosophy courses and I remember reading, being forced to read Plato and Aristotle and thinking, why are we, isn't, isn't this kind of like a museum piece? You know, like what we now know that, uh, you know, there are neurons determining your behavior. So what is this idea of the good? And I just, I, I really didn't get a proper <laughs> education, but my own choice when I was, a, when I was an undergrad, I just I was like, this is old. We have new stuff that has superseded this old stuff. Um, so I, that's very important to me. I, I want to uh, try, not in a kind of dogmatic, uh, uh, mindless way, but in a deep way to, to, help my son not take that um, worldview for granted or that presentism for, for granted. Um, and it's important because as our mutual friend, Patrick Deneen points out in his book, Why Liberalism Failed, <clears throat> um, that tendency to, that you have to, that all of life is, a, is man's own project, which he must kind of build anew all the time and ever more liberation, this drive toward ever more progress and liberation. What it does is it makes you re relate to the past in a very unhealthy way. More and more of the past becomes this dark age, which you is just was full of repression and horrors. Um, and that's a mistake. Uh, and, and, the rea and a kind of reaction comes up to it where you venerate everything from the past. Um, whereas if you have a kind of healthy attitude um, and you, uh, you, know, you have... Uh, proper philosophy and faith as a guide you can look at the past as you know a collection of good and bad instead of either um fetishizing the past or just treating it as as dirty and horrible and you know right now the the, the kind of uh our culture draw keeps drawing the line of what's the healthy 
uh, enlightened period and what's the dark past. And, and the line keeps coming closer to us so that even Dr. Seuss represents <laughs> you know, the dark, horrible past and his suspects somehow. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, uh, uh, I want my son to be able to relate to his heritage, which is I'm Iranian, as my wife's Chinese. Um, he's being raised as a Roman Catholic. To, so to look at church history, to look at American history, not with this kind of um, mindset that everything bygone was awful, frankly, which is a point maybe you and I take for granted, but I think a lot of our contemporaries don't. Yeah, it seems to me that if you, I mean, if you draw a parallel between between culture and individuals, there's some strong similarities. A person without a memory is basically lost his personhood. I mean, you're, you're part of an ongoing story and that story is both the good that you remember, but also the lessons you learn from the failures and the mistakes you make. You have to do both. You can't, as you say, fetishize the past and you also can't forget it. I think your book does an extraordinary service in constantly in each chapter going back and, and and mining the past for the lessons that are important now and the answers to the questions that you if I, Okay, just one quick line I would say is, um, I, I always read, um, this is something that I've heard Russell Kirk, I, 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 I wasn't a student of his or anything because I'm uh, before my time, but I, I've heard that he, or read that he just, he, whatever he read was like, okay, I'm gonna read it. What truth claims are there? What are the arguments and are they any good? And so, um, in some ways that may sound like an ahistorical, but I, I read, you know, if I'm reading some contemporary thinker or if I'm going back to Aristotle, it's the same attitude of like, what can I draw from this? Um, and that's reflected in the book. Um, but I think by adding nuances and biographical touches, it doesn't become, I think, the, 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 the whole of each chapter doesn't become ahistorical. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 in one of the chapters, uh, you, you make the point of, it's a great quote from Rabbi uh, Abraham Heschel about the Sabbath being um, the guarantor of inner liberty. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? Because it really is a fascinating line. Yeah, so Heschel was a, a mid-century um, Jewish intellectual um, uh, uh, driven by the Holocaust of the United States, like so many other great um, Jewish thinkers. And um, he came from the Hasidic world of, of, of uh, Tsarist ruled Poland. Uh, and he believed it was his mission to try to communicate something of the wisdom of that tradition to the modern world. And he especially emphasized the Sabbath um, as, as the source of liberty because um, uh, he, he thought about man's activities as taking place in two realms, the realm of space, uh, which, you know, economic activity, prosperity, geopolitical contest, but also there's this other realm, the realm of time, which he associated with, with God, frankly, with, with the eternal. Um, and he was worried that modern civilization was too much concerned with um, uh, the realm of space, and in doing so was uh, losing sight of the realm of time. And the realm of time for him uh, <clears throat> was opened up by the Sabbath to, to set aside, uh, you know, the kind of clamor and competition and rivalry and acquisitiveness of um, the realm of space, which dominates our, our everyday activity too often. Um, for one day, you, you just devote yourself to that other realm and to the realm of time. And um, uh, he, he saw it as a source of interior liberty because um, the realm of space is so concerned with things. He said, it's not just enough to be politically and socially free, which is to be independent of political tyranny. You also have to be free of, of things, uh, of that acquisitiveness that uh, drives so much of life. And so the Sabbath, by venerating non-work, by, by, by telling uh, uh, Israel uh, that their non-work is sacred, was very revolutionary uh, uh, in the ancient world, but it's equally revolutionary today. And so I argue that um, uh, we need a restoration, frankly, of the Sabbath. You know, this country had uh, a tradition of Sabbatarianism uh, Right up to not that long ago. No, in my uh, lifetime. 
in, in your lifetime, yes. Um, <clears throat> but I mean, and, 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 and the sort of Protestant tradition took it very seriously. Catholics, obviously, and the Jews, obviously, they, they, and Muslims as well, they all venerate different days as, as the, say, the Holy Day. But um, it was seen as not only in its religious dimension, but it, it was seen as a, as a help and an ally of the working man. Um, you know, today, a lot of working class people, these large corporations, I, Amazon particularly comes to mind, use algorithmic scheduling to just minimize the labor time without any regard for what that does to someone's weekend or schedule or whether they can um, uh, uh, have spent time with their children. And so <clears throat> uh, uh, I argue that the, the Sabbath uh, is not only kind of the protector of your interior liberty to set aside the acquisitiveness, but it can also be um, healthy and is healthy for the temporal sphere, for just the kind of common good of, of families and communities. Yeah, Amazon is a perfect example of really ruthless uh, uh, addiction. Labor practices, work. yeah. It's just, it's really, um, uh, you know, and as, a, as a, um, a consumer, it's terrific to get a book on on and delivered to your doorstep on Sunday, but people, I, I certainly don't, and I think a lot of people don't think through what that does to the individual delivering the book. Mm -hmm. um, Yet yeah, there's a great line, it may also be from Heschel in, in that chapter about the, the weekdays exist for the Sabbath, not the Sabbath for the weekdays. I'm wondering if that's even comprehensible to American culture now. I mean, it, it wasn't already, I mean, he, he wrote a book called Sabbath, I think in 1951, uh, or certainly the early 1950s, um, and he was addressing um, uh, American Jews, having come from Europe and come, come from this very pious background. And a lot of his fellow American Jews were, uh, you know, then fast secularizing. And um, those who had had one foot in Europe still saw American freedom as their true home and, and the freedom to shop, the freedom to work, the freedom to socialize as much as you want. And so he was already seeing this trend in his own community, and it applies to uh, Christians as well and other groups. Um, uh, it, 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 yeah, it's, it's, it's incomprehensible that you uh, live life on a liturgical rhythm. Um, uh, and uh, you know, for Catholics, especially, obviously, I mean, the rhythm of daily mass and then the rhythm of, uh, of uh, Sunday uh, as the Lord's Day. And then in <clears throat> also this kind of cycle of cosmic and uh, uh, supernatural events that are marked through the calendar of, of the normal kind of secular calendar. Um, all of this, uh, the meaning is, is lost for our fellow Americans, I think. I think you're right, it's very sad. So Rob, you have an entire chapter on the difference between spirituality and religious faith. And your argument, of course, is that generic spirituality um, somehow doesn't, uh, doesn't feed the soul in the way that faith does. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? I mean, what what exactly are the, the distinctions between the two? Because an awfully lot of people, as you know, are happy to say they're spiritual, but they aren't religiously affiliated. Yep, that's about 20% of Americans, depending on which poll you look at, it's a little bit higher, a little lower, believe that um, you don't need religion to be spiritual. And what I argue in that chapter is that um, a lot of those people actually are religious, they are doing kind of religious activities, you know, they, uh, uh, they, uh, uh, they eat only, I don't know, uh, kale and, and they, they <laughs> discipline the body in various ways and, and, and mindfulness, which has a serious aspect, but there's a kind of corporate uh, uh, version of it that's just bland nonsense. Right. So Philippism is coming back in, 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 in tech companies. Technique. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. But but that so so they 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 have some uh, rituals, but those rituals um, uh, aren't connected to a, a shared account of uh, the meaning of life uh, and the uh, larger questions about who we are, where are we headed, and and so forth. And that's why it fails as spirituality, not that it fails as religion. You have some religious ritual dimensions. It's just that because it's not connected to it, a, a um, a set of shared public meanings about the meaning of life, which is uh, uh, what religion brings into the picture, it ends up being uh, uh, falling short as, as spirituality. And I use the um, was it the chapters. I won't recount the whole thing because it's too long. But but uh, Victor Turner was this great anthrop British anthropologist of the 20th century who studied the um, uh, 
ritual practices of a, of a, 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 a central South African people called the Ndembu. And a lot of what we know, you know, he laid the foundations of modern anthropology of religions of what, what people gain when they do ritual, truly kind of religious ritual, um, that it um, helps relieve tensions that otherwise couldn't. It uh, ritual brings, uh, uh, you know, the chieftain and the lowest member of the community into submission before the higher power of their community, their sort of high god. And um, what's the amazing about the, uh, about uh, Victor Turner was that he was a Marxist and a you know completely secular man, but. Um, the encounter with African spirituality led him and his wife after they returned to Britain to enter the Catholic Church because they they found in uh, the mass the closest resemblance to that kind of entry into this uh, mystical space of ritual that they had first encountered among African tribals. The other thing that interested me about that is that uh, if he hadn't had that experience, he would have instead been inoculated against Christianity just simply by the nature of Western civilization. He had to encounter it outside in order to enter the church when he returned. It's really a yes, yes, that's right. Yeah. Genius yeah. way of, of, of bringing it up, I thought. Uh, however, however, having said that, uh, I have to jump to chapter ten. Uh, is sex a private matter? Because there's a certain number of people who are going to see that and go directly to that. Um, you know, in a Catholic perspective, uh, obviously sex is, because it's intimate, it's very private. On another yeah. level, for Catholics, sex is a very public thing, a very public concern, has public implications. Um, what, were you, what were you driving at in that chapter, yeah. and why, why is it, does it, sex have a public dimension? Also, so Rob, why, why is sex such a problematic issue for uh, people in our particular culture? So... Um... On, a, on the privacy of sex, I mean, obviously, in, in, the, uh, in an obvious sense, it is private because it's most of the time, uh, blessedly, we haven't gone to the stage where people have sex in, in public, although I don't see why, like, if we've gotten rid of every other norm, why this one shouldn't be preserved. But for now, it is. it takes place in a private space. Well, you haven't um, yet been to Mardi Gras. <laughs> Yeah, there you go. Yeah, um, but so the, the the focus of the chapter is is uh, you know, the radical feminist Andrea Dorkin, who argued that uh, what happens in the bedroom uh, isn't innocent of political dynamics, uh, or, or uh, 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 and it it ripples out to how we structure society as a whole and how women are treated outside the home as well, um, and in that view. She had a very uh, uh, unusual ally <laughs> or a, oh, a predecessor, was, yeah, um, Saint wonderful. Augustine, and I, the connection between Zorkin and and and, uh, uh, and, and Augustine, I, I, I confess, was none of the book scholarship in this book is original because I'm not a scholar. I just attempt. I'm a storyteller. I'm a journalist. It's um, Notre Dame's uh, John Cavadini who who uh, opened my mind to this, yeah, and I used it. Man. He, um, uh, you know, he, he argues that in some ways Dworkin, seen as this radical, uh, disagreeable woman in so many ways, um, hated even by liberals in her own time, um, that her view of sexuality as, the, as, a, as a public thing whose, whose um, element of lustful domination shapes the rest of society as well, she shared that with, with Augustine and his, his view of the there's a scene in, in the city of God where he recounts um, what it's like on the first night between a, a Roman bridegroom and, and the bride and uh, the whole kind of host of polytheistic gods who has to be in the room to kind of help the husband. And he mocks the husband because he's like, you know, the, you know, uh, Venus holds her down. So-and-so kind of uh, pr prima does this and that. And it's like, so what does the groom have to do? Augustine asks. Um, it's a very kind of, odd <laughs> bit of, I have to say, I know, but, really but also very smart. It um, really made me smile when I saw Dworkin quoting Augustine. <laughs> yes. Just really, yeah. just almost impossible to um, imagine. But I think, I mean, so I think, she, look, I, I, Dworkin was, uh, had such a sort of dark view of, of men and of human sexuality that he just thought the whole the very nature of the act makes it renders it illegitimate uh, or renders the woman kind of um, degrades the woman as such. Augustine wouldn't go so far. He would he would not blame the nature of the act, but the fall and, and our defective human will. But I think 
our culture, they would both be critics of our sexual culture because it's, um, uh, uh, it, it, it insists that sex is only private fun. Uh, and, uh, and yet, if that were the case, why are we so tormented by, by Me Too, um, by this kind of anxiety about who is the next powerful man to fall to his past misdeeds. So all the sexual liberationism clearly has come with a, with a price of not only um, uh, uh, women who are, uh, who, who rightly feel kind of indignant about the practices of the past five, six decades since the movement took off, um, but also men, I think, which I don't go into in the chapter, but um, I just don't think men are happy in hookup culture because it's, Oh, it infantilizes them. It infantilizes them, and it. I mean, they, they they want companionship because we're we're rational animals. We're not just merely, um, uh, 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 we're not merely lustful, mm -hmm. and um, uh, so I, I just thought it would be interesting to to explore these questions through two figures who very few people except the, the brilliant John Cavadini would put next to each other. You know, I'm, I'm considerably older than you are, and I can remember in the 60s thinking this was the best thing that ever happened, a kind of relaxation of sexual mores. And, you know, 40 years later, everybody's miserable, as you mm -hmm. point out. I mean, it, it, you, you need the stability of relationships in order for them to ripen and deepen. And, and um, it's a very, I, I mean, I think for me, that's one of the most important chapters in the book, the fact that you deal with that issue and deal with it so well. It also leads into my next question. Your chapter 11 is, what do you owe your body? And you have a really interesting, uh, so, I, again, I had to laugh. I mean, when you imagine the Sistine Chapel being painted by a Gnostic painter, uh, it's just a wonderful image. But what exact, for a general audience, what does that mean? What, what is Gnosticism and why is that significant in terms of our technological culture? So a lot of, cult a lot of scholars today um, dispute that there was such a thing as Gnosticism with a capital G in late antiquity. Um, I, I, I tried to read their case and then ultimately I, I went with Hans Jonas who's this um, uh, German Jewish philosopher, also a kind of post-Holocaust emigre to the United States, who became the first philosopher to interpret these movements uh, that sp sprang up in the first two, 300 years af after, um, uh, after Christ. And um, they're very different. So Marcionism is one Gnostic movement. Uh, and Manichaeism, Mandeism, these were all religions that sprang up in the aftermath of the Alexandrian conquest of the Middle East and North Africa. And um, so for that reason, as I said, a scholar say, no, you can't, you can't talk about them as though there was one Gnostic religion. But I think I was persuaded by Jonas that there was such a thing as Gnosticism. And so to get to the definition, these are all religions that are united by this view that that human beings and the cosmos are, are radically at odds. Unlike the classical tradition, which then Christianity absorbed into itself, which said that um, creation is good, that, that uh, the cosmos is the whole of which man is a part. And so therefore there's a kind of communion between them. You can understand the world around you as this intelligible structure. Um, uh, uh, that was the classical and Christian view, Gnostic religion said, no, 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 we're, we're not of this world. Um, the God of this world is, there is no God of this world. The, the God is actually transmundane. It's utterly beyond. And we are somehow trapped in these bodily, fleshly apparatuses um, that, that throb with disgusting desires and they are subject to decrepitude and they ultimately die. And that's a problem. We, we want to get out of the body. Um, uh, that we have to try to liberate the divine spark within. Mm -hmm. So if I had to summarize what Gnosticism is, and I know this was too long of a definition, it's it, all, all kind of impulses to me that have this element of uh, religions that have this element of uh, uh, the view that the, the divine spark is trapped within a bodily fleshly apparatus. Now, they're Gnostic in the sense that they all sort of believe that once you knew this, you were free. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it, you, 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 there's an element of knowledge, which an interior cult has, and, and they will, once, you're, once you have the higher gnosis, you become free. So there's a kind of religious structure to them that's related to the term Gnostic, 
But to me, the more important aspect is this um, opposition of spirit and matter. So um, obviously there are many, many things that are good about technology. I mean, it's impossible to imagine the world without it, particularly if you have, for example, a disabled child and technology has made the life of like our son who has Down syndrome much, much better because of that. On the other hand, technology also seems to um, in some ways have a, um, a desire to transcend the body. And you go into that in your, in your chapter. I mean, the, there's an element in, in the modern technocratic spirit that is uh, almost anti-incarnational. Mm -hmm. I mean, a very obvious example um, is uh, the movements that are called transhumanist. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, Kurzweil, you know, his, his <laughs> desire to, <clears throat> desire to, he believes that we're basically mind software that happens to be tethered to body hardware, but that it needed to be the case that at some point we will um, kind of transform our minds or souls, whatever you want to call them. Uh, we will migrate them to um, other non-bodily entities, you know, and eventually we, our personalities could live on forever in, in this kind of digital form and we will reach infinity through that. So that's a very sort of almost classically Gnostic impulse dream. Um, you know, but, but also, I mean, our account of sex and gender is, is frankly Gnostic, the idea that um, human beings uh, possess an interior gender awareness that is uh, at odds with their uh, bodily selves, so a, an interior self that is, is trapped inside the wrong uh, exterior fleshly form is a kind of Gnostic phenomenon. And then in, in other ways, we have, a kind, we have these pseudo-Gnosticisms uh, bred by technology, you know, um, this emphasis on distance learning, remote learning for children, uh, all of it accelerated by the coronavirus, but it was kind of underway before that, the way yeah. it, it changes neighborhoods that where you don't, sh you don't shop, you have it delivered to you eventually maybe by drones. Um, and the problem with all of that is that if you, begin to do that, uh, the, the bodily limits of, of the body, of the family, of the neighborhood, um, also impose norms on people. Um, but if you uh, get rid of that, so for example, you don't have to go out and meet someone to get lunch, um, you also lose neighborliness. Um, so again, the, uh, the structure of the book is such that in each chapter, we encounter some limits, in this case, the human body, and we see how the loss of it is paradoxically dehumanizing um, uh, uh, and the dream of freedom, uh, uh, the dream of unlimited freedom or unlimited autonomy, inside it lurks a sort of deeper unfreedom. You know, uh, I only have two questions um, to, remaining, and I appreciate your time, yeah. so Rob, uh, but there's... Uh, you made a reference to Hans Jonas a moment ago, and uh, you and I have a mutual friend in Archbishop Charles Chaput, and over the years, he's repeatedly quoted Jonas. Why, why is a secular Jewish philosophy philosopher who died 30 years ago significant for everyday Catholics right now? Well, um, Jonas was uh, a great believer in how... Um, in how the ancients uh, uh, and particularly the kind of uh, Greco-Roman tradition um, grounded people in, in reality and uh, uh, had a, an account of, uh, of human nature that is subject to a larger law, the natural law, um, and therefore has a norm. Um, and I think that's very important for Catholics um, because we have an incarnational faith uh, uh, that we not lose sight for, for our faith not to become too ethereal and Jonas is a good um, reminder of how important the body is uh, that uh, if you disdain the body and your faith becomes too frankly like the faith of my compatriot Mani the Persian prophet who, who uh, founded Manichaeism uh, uh, that there's a danger there's a danger of moral irresponsibility that lurks in that because as Jonas says, that which has no nature has no norm. If your body is not significant, a significant part of you is not a part of you dynamically fused to your soul. Uh, fused is even the wrong word, but uh, it's the best I can do, kind of dynamic fusion of, of soul and body. If you're not that, if the body is insignificant or, 
either dirty or horrible, um, then you can do with whatever what you want with the body in some ways. And you get, I think, a lot of modern uh, 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 developments that are very troubling about how we think about the body, as, as I discussed earlier. So that's, I think, why someone like Jonas is important to, to Catholics. And the, the thing to remember is that, uh, you know, through, uh, through uh, uh, the incarnation and then through the ascension and then the assumption of Our Lady, it's very important to remember that, that we have a, a bodily claim on heaven, not just a, not just a non-bodily claim on heaven, but that uh, uh, we are... Uh, granted a chance to be redeemed body and soul through a, a savior who really had a human body, was really brought to term by his mother uh, by, uh, and, and, and was not just spirit. Last question. Chris, you're writing your book, you're publishing your book, so Rob, at a time when an awfully lot of Christians feel very disoriented or just frankly depressed yeah. by the direction of the culture. And yet, um, in reading your text, is just filled with moments of real beauty and light and hope. Uh, why? I mean, what, what gives you hope and how do you see the future? My, uh, uh, you know, hope you is a, I, share, I share the pessimism. <laughs> I'm, I'm down to. Uh, it's been a rough time and, and um, sometimes I share it with a small group of friends on email. <laughs> um, so... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, no, but I mean, I, I look uh, yeah, as you know better than I do. You know, hope hope is a is a virtue, and so it's something that has to be practiced. And very distinct from optimism. Yes, exactly, exactly. You, as the famous saying goes, you know, I'm, I'm not an optimist, but I'm hopeful. Uh, um, so no, I mean, I look at my son, and I I have to have hope, even even beyond supernatural hope or. or barring supernatural hope, I have to have natural hope. So I want to, as a, as a father, I'm not gonna give up. I'm not gonna give up easily. And I also see, I mean, I also see uh, um, in the disintegration of the current uh, matrix of cultural, economic, political arrangements, um, I do see maybe among at least a, a number of young, intelligent Christians and Jews and others, um, something embryonic, in embryonic form of a, of a different mode of organizing life, uh, our common life together. Um, that, th those groups give me a lot of hope. And, and I sort of joked about emails, but it is, it's always, I talk to people in this group, in this group, in this group, and I see a kind of intellectual ferment among people of faith that, um, that buoys me as well and, 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 and helps me not lose sight of hope. Now, um, so Rob, the, the book uh, is, the Unbroken Thread, and it's available uh, starting May 11th. Is that correct? Yes, but it's available for uh, pre-order okay. now on, on Amazon. Yeah, Amazon, Barnes, and the usual. Beloved Amazon. Is yeah. <laughs> the <laughs> best is to go to penguinrandomhouse.com. It's <laughs> <laughs> uh, a terrific conversation, so Rob, and I'm so very grateful for the time you've committed to it. And uh, please, the audience, please buy the book. It's really just Absolutely terrific, a wonderful and very accessible read. So, so Rob, thank you so much.